I will now attempt to give a three-minute history of linguistic anthropology, although, as my wife recently reminded me, I can sometimes be a bit verbose. Imagine that from a professor, so it may turn into a five- or six-minute history. But linguistic anthropology, at least here in the States, really, I feel like, got its start in the late 1800s um, under the, there was the Smithsonian Museum, or the Smithsonian Institution was sending out or providing support for and publishing the works of a bunch of anthropologists that were basically going and recording languages and texts and cultural practices of Native American groups across the U.S., um, the Bureau of American Ethnology, doing kind of salvage ethnography again, this idea of capturing languages and culture before they were lost. Now, again, in many, many cases, they were wrong about things disappearing. Um, not all cases, but many cases. Nonetheless, they did sort of get the ball rolling as far as linguistic anthropology goes. At the time, it was mostly still linguistic documentation, and, like documenting the mechanics of the language and the folktale of the language, but over time it would evolve more and more into what we think of now as linguistic anthropology, this very sort of how does language shape culture and how does culture shape language. A few sort of really important figures along the way, uh, George Hunt, who was Klingit, uh, he worked closely with Franz Boas on linguistics of the northwest coast or here in Alaska we would actually think of it as the southeast coast or south southeast Alaska slash <laughs> southwest coast if you will um, but George Hunt did extensive work including with um, the Kwakwaka Wakwa linguistics which was a group that he had married into and had quite extensive familiarity with um, we also have Frances Densmore here she was an very, very early ethnomusicologist before that was called ethnomusicology. So she um, did extensive work using like wax cylinder recording back before they had records of um, indigenous songs and presenting those to the public um, through her writing. And it's still an archive that people draw on today, particularly she worked a lot with Plains groups of Native Americas, Americans, such as the Lakota. Um, this here is Benjamin Worf. Um, and he helped pioneer what we now think of as the superior wharf hypothesis. I also just always like that picture and want to show it every time I get a chance to. He's a dashing looking dude in that picture. Honestly, I mean, just in general, I feel like anthropologists were dashing looking people in these four pictures. But um, certainly, you know, Benjamin Wharf looks like a handsome dude ready to go out on the town. Anyways, he was a very pioneering linguist. He was a, um, he worked under this guy called Sapir. So definitely under Edward Sapir, anthropologists got really interested in language and culture. And then he and Worf both basically wrote about this idea of, especially Worf, of like, does language actually shape how we think? And that was like really, really getting to like some interesting anthropology stuff. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that later in the semester. And then um, Del Himes, who's pictured here on the right, um, the most recent of the four working in sort of the 50s and 60s onwards and um, throughout the 20th century. Del Himes was a very interesting figure. He was one of the founding figures in what we call the ethnography of communication, really kind of um, thinking through the things people say, especially the stories people tell as like a whole social production. It's not just a story, right? You, you go to the store and you pick up like a book of like, oh, folktales of the such and such group, folktales of the Irish, folktales of the such and such, or oral history of the Lakota or whatever, he was somebody to bring up, like, this all occurs in a social context and really look at it as, like, who is the speaker, who's the audience, what are they doing? He was also big into looking at patterns of communication and finding the poetic structure to a lot of oral storytelling that often gets missed um, by a lot of earlier anthropologists and historians and folklorists who were just, like, sort of, like, taking it and then giving it, like, a really, like, kind of lame English translation and then just like throwing it on a piece of paper and paragraphs. He really brought out, um, as did other folks, like especially Dennis Tedlock, um, who I had the fortune to study under these and a few other people brought up the fact that like there, are, there's poetry, right? There's poetry and oral storytelling and how people use their voice and where they end and what syllables they do and how they drag the words out that often isn't captured on the page itself. And so that's an, yet another example of somebody that was like kind of pushing the borders to think about language and communication more as like a cultural production and a social act, not just words for words sake. So that's a nice little three minute history of linguistic anthropology. 
We'll end finally by talking about the fourth subfield, biological anthropology. It's also um, often known as physical anthropology, although it's a lot more common nowadays for people to say biological anthropology. You also hear people describe themselves as bioarchaeologists, which, as the name implies, typically means that they're doing some of both, or they're doing biological anthropology, but kind of relating it to archaeology. <coughs> In any case, what is biological anthropology? Well, for one thing, it's where we get forensic anthropology. So if you've ever watched uh, the TV show Bones from a few years ago, where you have Temperance Brennan, that's actually based on a series of novels which were written by an anthropologist. And um, I haven't really watched the show a lot, but from what my wife has described to me, it sounds like in some regards they do a decent job of talking about what anthropologists are up to. And it is the case that you have a few, um, some anthropologists that work as forensic anthropologists. It's not like a huge career path that tons of people go into, but it does exist, certainly. Um, working for law enforcement agencies to identify victims, um, working for human rights tribunals to identify victims of um, mass killings, and um, other contexts as well. When I worked in Texas, I knew a physical anthropologist, a biological anthropologist, um, who was, and this is a very sad topic, um, tragic, he was, well, he worked with people um, who died as they went through the border trying to emigrate to the U.S. Um, from heat exhaustion or dehydration. And so people oftentimes, though, back home wouldn't know what had happened to their relative or family member. And so he was worked with a group of people um, who helped identify um, victims. Victims is the wrong word, sorry, but identify um, the dead so that their family could have... Um, at least the knowledge of what had happened to their family members. So they did genetic testing and other different things to figure out um, who these people were that were found um, on the border deceased. So yes, forensic anthropology is definitely part of what physical anthropology does, but biological anthropology or physical anthropology is also a lot bigger than that. It's a very broad field. Um, at its core, it's the study of the human body, past and present, uh, how it's evolved, how it's affected by society and culture, um, our and everything kind of to do with that. So they study both the past, sort of again, the hominin or human family tree, all the different stages of evolution leading to a modern Homo sapien. And they also study, okay, now that we have Homo sapiens, what is the diversity between different populations and how is that affected by social um, factors? So for example, biological anthropologists might be very interested in how the stress of being a, um, how the stress of being in certain kinds of social environments, such as being a refugee, perhaps, um, in a war-torn country, or being a displaced person in a war-torn country, they might be interested in, okay, what are some of the physical impacts on that on a population over generations, right? Um, so as you can tell, they sometimes deal with topics that are difficult and challenging, but also really critically important to talk about. Um, the... I like to think sometimes of culture, as I said before, as kind of our human software. And much like software, the same computer or human can be very, very different based on the kind of software it has and what you have downloaded on it. Um, my laptop can run very, very differently depending on how many files I have downloaded on it at a given moment and what I'm trying to run. At the same time, humans are not just software, right? It's great to talk about social constructions and culture, and different meanings and superior Borf hypothesis, but at the end of the day, we are physical beings as well, right? Our, those beautiful brains of ours are housed in a physical body. There is hardware. Um, we are our bodies and our ability to produce culture actually is rooted in our brain's capacity to engage in things like symbolic thought and certain kinds of communication. So physical anthropology gets at that, gets at our human bodies. Um, and when we say human too, we should clarify for, given the evolutionary focus of biological anthropology, they study not just humans, or as we might say, anatomically modern homo sapiens, if we're being really fancy about it, but they also study um, all of the hominins, so any sort of um, genetic relative of human beings in the fossil records, such as the Australopithecus group, such as the Paranthropus group, the Ardipithecus group, and the various other um, now extinct forms of Homo, such as Homo habilis um, and Homo rudolfensis, um, Homo erectus, um, Homo hydrobul hydrobulgensis, which is not an easy one to say, and so forth. 
as well as as well as there is a small but noticeable branch of biological anthropology that engages in primatology and in this regard it starts to overlap with and look a lot like wildlife biology but it has more of a behavioral focus um, biological anthropologists that go out and study chimpanzees or bonobos or gorillas trying to better understand past evolution by understanding um, what are sort of the most recent species to have branched away from the human line or for the human line to have branched away from depending on one's perspective of course i suppose that was a little anthropocentric of me i suppose a chimp would say we branched away from them um so anyways that's what biological anthropologists are up to and the focus um, is the present genetic diversity of humans, how we got to be so diverse, um, how our physical makeup is affected by our genes, but also by our environment, etc., etc. So, and again, although we tend to think of them as working with skeletal remains of past beings that lived thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, at the same time, there are definitely um, physical and biological anthropologists now that are working on biometrics, nutrition studies, uh, trying to figure out, again, how environment affects people today. Um, some key concepts, um, obviously evolution, we will talk about this in this course to some degree, um, later, particularly in about three weeks, we'll spend a couple of weeks talking about physical evolution of hominins, and, um, specifically though, I'm going to kind of go out on a limb and assume most of you have at least a little exposure to evolution as a concept where it gets kind of interesting and different for biological anthropologists is that they have to approach it from a biocultural perspective because unlike the evolution of most species, human species and arguably our closest hominin sort of relatives um, are profoundly impacted by culture as well. When humans started developing, or rather I should say hominins, started developing tools, that meant they could have much shorter teeth, right? They no longer needed to invest the same sort of resources in having fangs and things like that once they had stone tools. That's one simple example. I've shared before in class a more complex example, such as why certain populations have higher lactose tolerance, which is actually a mutation and a deviation from the human norm. Um, so culture is a big part of what affects us. Um, when people um, have ideas of ethnicity or race, and that can cause um, effects on people, such as different health outcomes if people have different access to health care. So culture is part of sort of how our bodies work as human beings. We're not just biological beings. We're affected by our culture. Obviously, they're very, very interested in genes and gene distribution and gene flow. Um, you know, again, I'm going to assume most people are at least borderline familiar with genes. We'll talk about it more in a few weeks, but basically, um, you know, we are, our bodies are coded for by a series of base nucleotides, um, A, G, T, and C, which I always remember from the movie Gattaca, because that came out when I was a kid. But anyways, um, we have base nucleotides. Those four little base nucleotides can be combined in a gajillion different ways and make um, the genetics that are you. And they code to say, you know, this person will have red hair, this person will have this amount of melanin, things like that. Um, and as there are pressures or selection pressures or different pushes and pulls um, from the environment or from the culture, certain genes get, as we say, selected for and become more common in the population, repeat that over and over and over again, and suddenly you have, as one example, a lot of people with red hair or a lot of people with lactose tolerance or a lot of people with lactose intolerance and so on and so forth. Um, and then gene flow. We'll talk about this in the module on race, but one of the important ideas that is important for understanding biological anthropology is that we recognize that although gene flow can be concentrated, um, so yeah, and then another thing is just that, you know, sorry, I kind of got interrupted in my thought because my kiddo came in, gene flow, basically that human beings are one species and truly one species, meaning that genes have been flowing all around the human family um, to begin with and still do to this day. And so that's one of the reasons why the idea of these like truly distinct races that we tend to think of is does not work well when you're actually mapping actual human genetics, because human populations across the world have been sharing and swapping DNA back and forth for a very, very long time. Um, another key term 
key concept is identification, trying to place a given individual within their broader species context or within their specific sort of subpopulation context. Um, hominins as a term for, again, things like all the sort of, as I sometimes say, the ape-like humans and the human-like apes uh, that are in the fossil record. And then repatriation is another key concept. And so I mentioned this before, but there are um, big issues with physical anthropology historically as far as unethical, immoral um, possession of human remains, particularly from indigenous populations that were not donated, but were instead um, sort of taken from areas that were burial places. And so there have been there was a major push several decades ago for a law for repatriation that was passed. Um, and some anthropologists now, some anthropologists have resisted that. Um, some anthropologists have been very, very on board with that and very for it. And I would say the um, anthropologists of the current generation are generally very, very for it, that this is an important and vital thing to be doing uh, to be making sure that we, um, that anthropology is living up to good ethical standards and not being a perpetuator of sort of this colonial dynamic. So repatriation is another concept that if you ever go into biological anthropology, you want to be familiar with. Um, key methods. So biological anthropology uses a variety of method. Some of them rely on analyzing past human beings, particularly their skeletal remains. So this is Mary and Louise, Louis Leakey, two really famous biological anthropologists that did some really key research on and trained some really key researchers on work in East Africa. Um, work in East Africa. Um, with hominin ancestors. And so they're, so they're a good example of this, right? Spending months out in a desert uh, trying to find skeletal remains of um, hominins living hundreds of thousands of years ago, such as the Lucy skeleton and so forth. Um, and so we call that paleoanthropology. Um, the methods of doing this are very precise and very technical to understand skeletons at this level, which is one of the reasons that it lends itself well also to um, forensic anthropology eventually as a sort of offshoot of this. Um, this is part of the way that we're sort of able to reconstruct the human family tree. Also, obviously, genetic methods nowadays as something that um, has just grown in leaps and bounds over past decades, still has a lot of room to grow but has grown in leaps and bounds. I've mentioned also primatology and then also bioarchaeology, um, trying to understand skeletons in their archaeological or cultural context. And then again, sort of modern day, uh, working with modern populations, doing biometrics, basically measuring people's body and how well their bodies are responding to stress and things like that. Um, a th sort of three or five minute history. Um, you can start the history of physical anthropology different places. Um, one logical place to do it would be in the mid-1800s with Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution. Um, after the origins of species, Tar Darwin came to write um, a fair bit about his theories about human evolution. Uh, obviously, this was in some circles extremely controversial at the time. Um, certainly, is not entirely uncontroversial now, um, but that definitely influenced um, many different people. Eventually, physical anthropology developed um, further. It was, you know, in the 1800s, you had people like Darwin that fed into this, were kind of like a, a root of physical anthropology. You also had, at the time, um, debates over race and a lot of, I don't know that you would call them biological anthropologists, but a lot of people who fancied themselves um, scientists of the human body that felt very strongly that there were very distinct differences between races. And so that is also one of the things that influenced biological anthropology, um, partly in the sense that sort of modern biological anthropology sort of took a, a, a sharp left turn from that, right, and came to see that as a very inaccurate way of sort of understanding the human body partly because of people like Franz Boas. Sorry to keep going back to him. I promise we're not always this obsessed with him, but he just comes up a lot in this particular lecture. Um, he looked at, essentially, as an immigrant himself, he looked at the, he did measurements on the bodies of immigrants. He had people come 
speaking of labs, right, he had people um, where he would like measure their arm, measure their skull, things like that, which seems bizarre. But one of the things he was trying to prove and eventually did prove with a lot of scientific data is that there were assumptions made about the brain size, among other things, of immigrant populations that were very inaccurate and partly reflected the fact that people were coming into the U.S. with nut nutrient deficiencies because of where they were emigrating from. They were often emigrating from bad situations. But then once they were in the United States and once you got into like the second generation, um, folks had very similar um, biological measurements to anybody else in the States. And sort of that finding now probably doesn't seem terribly shocking at the time was really revolutionary to say that parts of what we consider to be these big differences between populations are very much plastic they are very much to do with the environment somebody's under the food that they're receiving not some sort of like primal difference between different populations of humans not to say there aren't differences there definitely are but to suggest that they are far more um, subtle than what people were thinking at the time so that was another thing that sort of led to biological anthropology especially its focus on sort of culture and biology as two things that you have to look at together um, the leakies in the 20th century and their finds in east africa and a number of others as well um, who in turn helped teach several primatologists including um, Jane Goodall, including Diane Fossey and her work with gorillas. So all of these are kind of important moments in the history of biological anthropology. Now I kind of want to conclude um, by talking about, now that we've talked about biological anthropology and talked about all the four fields, I hope you're getting a sense of that they all have an important part of the story to tell, but that their methods again are just so different. Uh, so it might be reasonable to ask yourself, how did it come to be that all of these were considered one field and that they didn't like, why isn't it like we have like human biologists over here and like archaeologists hanging out with historians and like cultural anthropology is like their own weird thing. How is it that it came to be them all kind of in one thing and why you have like a department like our own at University of Alaska Anchorage where up at the Anchorage campus we have um, a couple of cultural anthropologists and an archaeologist and then down here at Kenai Peninsula it's a cultural slash linguistic anthropologist right we have these departments where we have like multiple different people doing really different things from each other. The answer for where that came from is, well, A, it's not like that everywhere. There are parts of the world where that's anthropology is divided up very differently. But B, the reason it looks that way in North America is in part because this um, guy, Franz Boas, who I, I just love this picture. He looks bizarre in it. He's, he's, it's, it's at the World Fair. He's exhibiting something. But anyways, maybe he's exhibiting how strange anthropologists are. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so Franz Boas, though, he helped found the field partly because he trained many of the early anthropologists as anthropology started shifting from sort of like a hobby for a lot of people or something that a few government researchers did to an actual like scientific field that you trained for at a college and then got professional training in and went and did professionally. Um, Franz Boas was taught a whole generation of anthropologists, basically a ton of anthropologists at the time were either taught by him or indirectly taught by him or he mentored or he was in contact with by mail and his ideas were very influential and he happened to be for a field. He did all of these kinds of research, some more than others, but he did work on physical anthropology. He did work a little bit on archaeologists. He on archaeology, he did linguistic work, he did cultural work. Um, and so he kind of paved the way for this idea that if we want to understand human beings, we need to understand, yes, their present day social lives, them and their communities, but, uh, and, but also their language in a really in-depth way. But also we need to look at their past and also we need to look at their bodies. And we hope in doing so we have an important story to tell and one that contributes in interesting ways to the rest of the conversation going on around the universities and indeed around the world about what it is to be human and what makes us so so oddball and also what makes us so great and what makes us the same and what makes us different um now the final question might be okay great that all sounds awesome sign me up but are you sciencing or not is this a science or what um I would say it depends who we're talking about. Some anthropologists, it's very humanistic in nature. It's almost artistic in nature. You have people like Ruth Bahar, for example, or Barbara Tedlock, who um, write their up their ethnographic reflections almost as these like novel like things, um, which 
don't feel like a scientific report. They feel like this really kind of artistic narrative, and that goes all the way back to Gladys Reichardt, who I mentioned before. On the or Paul Stoller is another really good example of that, talked in a very personal way about his experiences as a quite literal sorcerer's apprentice. Um, by contrast, you have other people doing other kinds of research that feels very, very scientific in the kind of the classic sense of the term that we think of science as sort of numbers and charts and um, trends and hypotheses. So a lot of the work done by biological anthropologists, quite a bit of the work being done by archaeologists, and sometimes even some of the work being done by cultural anthropologists and linguistic anthropologists um, gets into this kind of very like technical quantitative side. And then there's a whole lot of people that are somewhere in between though, where it's not really super artistic, but it's also not this sort of hardcore like charts and numbers kind of thing. It's more of kind of a blend. It is um, a scientific report, but it's one that maybe doesn't read like how you would expect. It reads a little bit more like maybe a history paper, a history and article, except for it's got a lot of quotes. And that's the data, right? Our data, when we talk about culture, a lot of times our data is not something we can put in a test tube. It's the quotes, it's the experiences, it's the stories people shared with us. Um, so is that science or not? Well, I think it is sometimes, and I think sometimes it's more of a humanity, but I think also we need to ask ourselves what exactly we mean by science, this word we put so much investment in, and realize that science itself is a lot more diverse than we give it credit for. It's not just people hanging out in labs with lab coats and test tubes, although those people do great work. Um, first of all, we should recognize that there are scientific disciplines that lend themselves well to finding laws, things that work all the time, or at least they're supposed to work all the time, such as in physics, things like the law of gravity or the laws of thermodynamics. There are other sciences where, yes, they may come upon laws, sometimes trends that seem to hold true always or most of the time, but their primary thing that they're doing is explaining what we observe. Yes, they will relate it to larger laws, but the discipline itself is less about finding laws and more about explaining what we observe in the world around us, more about observation than experimentation, because there are some things that cannot be experimented with. You can't put human history in a lab, uh, but you can observe it out in the real world, and then you can ask logical questions and do research to eliminate theories that don't make a lot of sense and instead come up with theories that seem to work better. Um, and in that regard, anthropology is not completely unlike a lot of other fields. Um, sometimes astronomy, sometimes wildlife biology. This is David Meck, who is a, a well-known wolf biologist. Um, sometimes botany, sometimes, sometimes geology even. Fields where um, the very complex and huge and vast nature of what we're studying out there is so big that it doesn't fit in a lab, but we can observe what's going on out in the field and learn really interesting things. And sorry, Isaac Asimov, but a lot of times with anthropology, it's less predictive and more descriptive. We can't always predict what's going to happen. I mean, we can predict some things, right? Culture picks up agriculture, it's going to pick up hierarchy nine times out of 10, and maybe 10 times out of 10. But for the most part, what we're doing is we're making sense of things that have already occurred and why they occurred, and also things that are going on right now, trying to better understand where they came from. And I think that's its own sort of valid and really valuable and important research. And I hope you see it that way too as we move throughout this course. Um, or to quote Alfred Kroeber, anthropology, as he says, is the most humanistic of the sciences and the most scientific of the humanities. It's sort of this in-between place, and I think one that's really valuable and useful to the sciences and the humanities. So again, I hope you find it to be so as well.